Ian Smith was cheated and deceived by the British government. When he declared Rhodesia an independent sovereign state in 1965, the British government resented it. How dare a mere colony display such arrogance? If a British colony seeks to claim its independence, then it is obliged to adhere to a protocol. Its government waits for the Queen to arrive and haul down the Union flag with due ceremony, whereas Ian Smith snapped his fingers in the faces of the British colonialists in Whitehall and declared independence, and the British government reacted with its usual indignation. This had only ever happened once before, of course, in 1776. Spot of bother in the New World, my lord. When the Americans declared independence and roundly thrashed the English, it is my contention the correct side emerged as the victor. Well, we tried to interfere in Rhodesia, and this exacerbated their internal conflicts. Maoist rebels, aided and abetted by Zambia, also sought to destabilize the nation. Remember, Ian Smith was not some grim and grisly monster. He was a fighter pilot in World War II and suffered horrific facial burns as a result of an especially brutal encounter during the Battle of Britain. Rhodesia was also never an apartheid state, a fact most loony lefties fail to realise or, worse still, prefer to ignore. Also, we are obliged to consider the external intervention made by Western governments in order to satisfy their own agendas. As soon as British naval ships began to depart from the Indian Ocean, Russian ships gradually yet inexorably sailed into the area. A fearsome prospect. Soviet Russia sent aid, armaments and technology to Angola and Mozambique during the 1970s in an attempt to destabilize their governments and cultivate militancy among terrorist groups. Next to that, we have the absurd situation of the British government sending food and medical aid to Mozambique, which, by early 1977, was used by the terrorist groups employed to enter Rhodesia and commit brutal atrocities against any ordinary black people who refused to participate in their rebellion against the official government of Ian Smith. Many people at this time were old enough to remember, with a horrified shudder, the disgusting atrocities committed by the Mau Mau against innocent people and feared a repeat of such scenes in Rhodesia as Soviet-trained or at least Soviet-assisted terrorist troops, who refer to themselves as liberators and freedom fighters naturally, invaded Rhodesia and proceeded to butcher nuns and school teachers, among others. Incidentally, the British armed forces merit praise and approbation for their swift and efficient action against the Mau Mau murderers, a fact most loony lefties prefer also to ignore. By 1978, the situation developed further, possibly as a result of continued sanctions imposed by the British government, the Ian Smith regime issued a proposal to allow 28 government seats out of a total of 100 to be reserved for white members for a period of 10 years, during a transition from one form of government to the next. The name of the nation was also to be changed to Zimbabwe, just as Tanganyika changed to Tanzania, perhaps to disguise its turbulent history. Added to this, we had Joshua Nkomo and Robert Mugabe, both of whom led two separate parties, each of which called itself the Patriotic Front. I wonder if their members were always able to remember to which team they belonged. At this juncture, the Colosseum scenes from the life of Brian are impossible to ignore. These two groups were armed, funded and aided by Zambia and Mozambique. For an extended period in 1978, the casualties in this internecine struggle were of the order of 100 deaths per week. The official leader of Rhodesia by this time was Abel Muzuera, an ordained bishop. He held a series of intense talks with Ian Smith in 1978. Muzuera stated his position. The government accepts majority rule and it must be implemented by a process of one man, one vote. Smith agreed to both these conditions. Now, Joshua Nkomo acquired an impressive army, by force. In Britain in the early 19th century, the Royal Navy acquired ratings by physically kidnapping ordinary citizens, any males aged between 16 and 50. The groups of thugs employed to execute this barbaric practice were called press gangs. Is it from this we derive the word impressed, I wonder? 
Anyway, the thugs employed by Nkomo emulated the British Navy in every detail. They invaded schools, weddings, and even funerals to grab young men and force them to join their despicable band of savage murderers. In a profoundly cynical display of contempt for these victims, Nkomo called his press gang troops a liberation force, as if these poor souls were engaged in a noble struggle against tyranny. This is especially repugnant when you consider the majority of these troops were kidnapped from Zambia, Botswana and Mozambique. They received their training from small cadres of Cuban and Russian army instructors. All this happened while Mozarera was engaged in calm and civilized discussions with Ian Smith over the peaceful transition of power from the white majority government of Smith to the black majority government of Bishop Mozarera. It was always the intention of Nkomo and Mugabe to bully and intimidate black Rhodesians not to accept the plebiscites given to Mozarera in the free election plan for December 1978. Remember, Nkomo and Mugabe were both urged by their paymasters, the Soviet Russians, to create a one-party Marxist state in the country once Smith resigned. <laughs>